Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. It's Party Elite taking a look at some glorious news we have just received earlier this week. Rome 2 Total War, or Total War Rome 2, is getting a massive new piece of DLC. Now, this was released in 2013, this game, and now four years later, we're seeing a great deal of additions in the form of this DLC, as well as the free update that both release on the 30th of November. Before we start, I apologize for any and all butchered pronunciations. Now, there's plenty of information already out there. We're getting 10 factions, five of which are going to be deemed heroic factions, giving them grander objectives for their campaigns, custom crafted quest chains, and the equivalent of the undying legendary lords that we've grown used to with the Warhammer games. There will be timestamps in the description below if you're less interested in history and more interested in the actual gameplay mechanics and the specific factions. Set during the crisis of the 3rd century, we're going to see a very important period in Roman history and have the chance of saving Rome or tearing it apart. This is a period where we saw over 20 emperors come and go over a span of 50 years between 235 and 285. Though the game will kick things off in the year 270, let's take a look at where this crisis began. Septimus Severus was in charge of the empire between 193 and 211 and at the time began a policy of keeping the troops happy by increasing their pay. This on its own wasn't an issue, but coupled with the much needed increase in the size of the Roman army due to foreign threats, Severus had to debase the currency by adding less precious metal to the coinage. This itself isn't a problem, but it set a precedent which we'll come back to later. It also gave the army more political power. This dynasty, the Severan dynasty, came to an end with Alexander because Alexander's mother had put in place some pay cuts for the army and they weren't too pleased. When it became clear that Alexander was a puppet, the troops lost respect for him and when he later decided to pay off Germanic tribes for peace rather than taking a more martial approach, he was deemed unworthy and was assassinated along with his mother by his own commanders. Thrax, a Thracian soldier, then took control, the first of the Barracks Emperors. The Barracks Emperors were the many emperors who were put to power by the Roman army rather than by proper succession laws. As long as you were generous to the army, popular among the soldiers, and able to get good results, you were safe. Otherwise, you were assassinated and replaced. Between the end of the Severan dynasty and Diocletian, there were 20 emperors. Thrax was killed because he brought about a state of constant warfare and was weak in the face of civil unrest, plague, and other matters of statesmanship. Then, we got emperors that died in battle or were assassinated or were ousted, ultimately getting to the age of Aurelian in 270. He too was assassinated, but more on that in a bit. To summarize, this was a time of great political turmoil in the Roman Empire, with constant shifts in power and a lot of political strength in the army. And so, confident that they could do a better job on their own, Postumus founded the Gallic Empire and Odenathus founded the Palmyrene Empire. Neither of these factions were rebellions against Rome proper, instead they were furthering the interests of the Romans in their given regions. Despite that though, it was quite clear it would seem that sovereignty was up for grabs for both of these fractions of the empire. This is where we begin our campaigns. The first of the playable culture groups is that of the Romans. Roman culture factions will have morale benefits in home and ally territory, but will suffer diplomatic penalties when dealing with each other to reflect that inward hatred. The only piece to actually include Rome, historically, is led by Aurelian or Lucius Domitius Aurelianus Augustus. As we've already seen, the game has us starting to the east of Italy, needing to remove the Roman pretenders from Italy first. The historic unifier of Rome in this time period, Aurelian was responsible for bringing the Palmyrene Empire and the Gallic Empire back under the fold of Rome proper in the years 272 and 274, bringing the empire back to its former glory. Playing as Aurelian, we're likely to have these very objectives as the end game. Aurelian ultimately died in 275 on his way to Asia Minor in a campaign against the Sassanids. As a man who gave out strict punishments, there were many who feared the severity of his judgment should they be caught in even the most minor of crimes, and so, one man who was afraid of the punishment that might await him for telling a lie, forged a document that suggested the emperor was looking to execute a handful of men. This ultimately led to his assassination in Thrace. His premature passing meant that, though the empire was unified once more, it had not fully stabilized politically. Chances are we're looking to avoid that premature death in the game. With that said, it'll be interesting to see if the unique event chains for the Roman Empire will include these situations of harsh punishments and how they might come back to bite Aurelian in the back. The faction gets a boost to marching distances and a reduced resistance to foreign occupation. Palmyra, or the Palmyrene Empire, led by Queen Zenobia, is the eastern fragment of the empire. Queen Zenobia was regent to 10-year-old Vibalathus, and she intended to keep Rome happy. No rebellious forces here, no sir, nothing to look at. 
she kept herself occupied with borders with Persia and local tribal opposition in the form of the Tanukid. In the spring of 270, she led campaigns against these tribes and then ultimately turned into the conquest of Roman Arabia, Egypt, and more. When Vibalathus took the title of emperor at the end of the year 271, Aurelian had to respond and did so with a swift and harsh push, destroying all who would resist. Until he had a vision that was at the outskirts of Tiana, home to the famed philosopher Apollonius. In this vision, Aurelian was asked to spare Tiana to show mercy if he wanted victory. And so he was merciful, and as news of this mercy spread, Aurelian was welcomed into cities where he might otherwise have to do battle. When Zenobia was ultimately captured, she was dealt with harshly. The faction benefits from increased research rates and reduced banditry resulting from the construction of cult buildings as a reflection of piety. It will be interesting to see how the Palmyrene Empire might evolve from the start to the end of a playthrough, likely dealing with local issues at first before Rome comes calling, much like the Gallic Empire as well. Gallic Rome, or the Gallic Empire, was established in 260 by Postumus, and at its height included Germania, Gaul, Britannia, and at least temporarily Hispania. In the year 274, Aurelian finished his reconquest of these lands. The leader of this faction, as of 271, was Gaius Tetricus, or Gaius Pius Isuvius Tetricus. This is the man we will be leading the faction with in-game as well. Why not Posthumus? Well, because Posthumus was killed by his own troops in 269, that's why. Naturally, the reign of Gaius Tetricus only lasts for three years as the Gallic Empire fell in 274, but despite being showcased as a trophy by Aurelian, his life was spared, and Tetricus was even given a position of political power in Italy. This was a show of mercy that Aurelian used to show that he was a just man who only used as much force as necessary. In the game, that certainly won't do, I imagine. Uh, Tetricus will probably have to start by putting down the Germanic tribes that rose in rebellion, trying to take advantage of the confusion during this transition of power at the time. And historically, Tetricus didn't look to expand his territories too far beyond regions that had already been reclaimed by the Central Roman Empire. It'll be interesting to see a campaign that is more centered around diplomacy and politics, but I imagine the reconquest of Rome is going to play at least some part of the campaign, if not defending against Aurelian's forces. The faction receives a public order bonus for regions with Latin culture, as well as a reduction in cost for political actions. The Germanic kingdoms will have the option to always fight knight battles and also increase their income from raiding and sacking, and they include the Saxons, the Gothi, and the Marcomanni. The Saxons were a group that lived along the northwestern coast of present-day Germany, and in the later parts of the 3rd century, either side of the English Channel had been fortified by the Romans into what is called the Saxon Shore. The preparation of these fortifications takes place between the year 270 and somewhere in the 290s. Some think the name is derived from the fact that the Saxons settled in this area, and others suggest it is one that was attacked by the Saxons. There are accounts of the coast being, quote, infested with Franks and Saxons, end quote, but as a non-historian and a complete non-authority on the topic, I think the former makes for a better setup as to the situation in the game. Led by King Sigaric, we're going to see a bonus in movement range for fleets and a reduced cost to converting buildings in all regions. As they are not a heroic faction, their objectives might be as simple as a number of provinces needing to be put under their control rather than a specific story or historically driven campaign. The Gothi, or Goth, like to wear black clothes with dark eyeliner, dyed black hair, and sometimes paint their nails black as well. In the past, however, they referred to the East Germanic groups, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. It was around the year 270, in fact, that the Goths mounted an invasion on the Roman Empire under the leadership of Cannabodes. Historically, Aurelian was victorious, killing Cannabodes in battle, though he did have to surrender certain regions. In 275, the Goths later launched an attack on Asia Minor, though that didn't go too well as they were defeated in 276 by Marcus Claudius Tacitus, Roman Emperor from 275 to 276 after Aurelian was assassinated. Cannabodes, also known as Cannabis, led the tribe known as Thervingi, and they were first recorded as a distinct group in the year 268 during that initial invasion of Rome where they got pretty close to being a threat to Italy itself until Aurelian pushed eastward to reintegrate the Palmyrene Empire and decided to take a detour in dealing with the Goths. In game, we see a reduced cost to recruiting cavalry units and level 1 weapons for units armed with swords upon recruitment for all provinces. As a heroic faction, I suspect their goals will be lofty, probably to lead a successful invasion of Italy itself and to destroy the Roman Empire. The Marcomanni are another Germanic confederation of tribes, and they have a long history of conflict with Rome. As a non-heroic faction, I imagine their goals in the game will also be relatively simple, though they did survive till the end of the Roman Empire itself. I don't think they were a key player in this time period, but rather an inconvenience. Led by a King Burkhard, the faction will have a boost to morale when fighting barbarian tribes, 
and will have a much higher chance of successfully launching an ambush. The Eastern Empires make up another culture group and these will have reduced banditry across all provinces and will have increased income from commerce buildings as a representation of the Silk Road. Only two playable factions here, the Sassanid and Armenia. The Sassanids succeeded the Parthian Empire and went on to become a world power as the last stretch of the Persian Empire pre-Islam. The ruler we'll be seeing is Hormuz I or Hormuz Ardashir, the Shahanshah of the Empire as of May 270 and stayed as such till June 271. The Empire has a long history against the Roman Empire and it would make sense that as a heroic campaign they might look to become the power in the region before pushing in to conquer the Palmyrene Empire and then taking Italy proper. The faction will reflect its local power by having small diplomatic bonuses when dealing with eastern and nomadic factions, and they'll also have a decent charge bonus for all cavalry units under a trait that is called Asfaran, literally meaning horsemen. Armenia in the year 270 is in a very interesting situation. Not only is Christianity rapidly spreading in this formerly Zoroastrian part of the world, but the faction ruler we're getting in game, Narse, was only the king of Armenia from 273 to 293 after which he became the Shahanshah of the Sassanid Empire by overthrowing Bahram III. And yet, Armenia remained an issue for the Sassanid Empire, allying with Rome under the rule of Tiridates III, who was supposed to be the rightful ruler of Armenia at the time. The faction traits give extra experience ranks for the commander's units and also give diplomatic bonuses with Roman factions, and I suspect their goals as a non-heroic faction will likely remain in the east, hoping to solidify their hold over the land and maybe destroy the Sassanid Empire. Religion, or at least the cult of Christianity, will play a big part in Armenia's game as they were the first to make Christianity the state religion, well before the Romans. Another cultural group is that of the nomadic tribes, getting much more ammo for range units as well as three extra recruitment slots in their home provinces. There is only one playable faction in this group, the Alani. The Alani were an Aryan nomadic group with connections to Central Asia that migrated westward over the course of many centuries, starting from the first, when they'd settled just north of the Black Sea and raided the Parthians and Roman provinces in the region. In the time period that we're playing, the Germanic Goths would have pushed the Alani back further east, so I'm curious to see what they'll be looking to accomplish as a non-heroic faction. Clearly, they will start on the steppes, as one of their traits is called Step Dominance, giving them better diplomatic bonus with nomadic barbarian tribes, and they will also have extra experience ranks for nomadic cavalry recruits in all provinces. The final cultural group is that of the Britannic Celts, getting a decent charge bonus to all units and a great boost to sanitation in all provinces. There's only one playable faction under this group as well, the Caledonians. The Caledonians have a long history with the Roman Empire and the unified nature of the people is questionable. They were likely a group of tribes with many chiefs among them working together. Romans used the word Caledonius to refer to the Caledones as well as the other tribes living north of Hadrian's Wall. Considering the game's title, we might be getting this Roman interpretation in-game. There is a pretty large gap in their recorded history, and given their constant back and forth with the Romans, I imagine as a non-heroic faction, their in-game objectives will likely revolve around controlling the region around them, perhaps defeating the Gallic Empire, and maybe taking Rome proper as well. The faction traits will give them a decent boost to melee attack in their own and allied provinces, and they'll also have a moderate boost to diplomacy with non-barbarian tribes. Apart from the bespoke events and the unkillable faction leaders of the heroic factions, we're going to see new events, dilemmas, and missions to add more interest to the campaign. We're also going to see banditry as another factor on the campaign map, increasing as your empire grows, only to be reduced by specialized buildings or the presence of a military force. As banditry levels rise, you'll see food shortages and even special bandit events. Plagues were a common occurrence in this era as well. In fact, Claudius died of the plague in 270 and was succeeded by Aurelian himself. Expect to see settlements slow in growth, decrease public order, and reduce economic benefits as they get struck by disease. This disease can then spread to neighboring provinces or be transferred through military movements and trade routes. Technology and sanitation buildings are the only defense against disease. Cults are also going to make an appearance in the form of Christianity, Mithraism, and Manichism. Christianity is a little-known cult, you might have heard of it, and as I mentioned earlier, it was spreading rapidly in Armenia. In fact, they adopted it as the state religion before it was cool. Cult buildings are free to build, standing to represent the acceptance of these cults, though said acceptance can bring foreign culture and disorder to your provinces. The removal of these cult buildings is very expensive and severely hurts public order, as it's seen as a form of persecution. So you'll need to pick and choose how you'd like to welcome or oust various cults. General's skills are getting an overhaul as well, perhaps following more on the lines of what we saw with Warhammer, and we're also looking at tech trees that are being redesigned for each cultural group in the time period, and rather than being an actual tech tree, they're more along the lines of story progression trees, particularly for the heroic factions. 
Aurelian's tech tree speaks to military reform and unification and defense of the empire. Zenobia's tech tree relates to her rise to power, while Tetricus will show a lean towards politics. Hormuz will look to live up to his predecessors, while Kananades will tell a story of perseverance, unity, and bloodlust. New building chains and new units are to be expected, of course, and you can learn a bit more about that in the link provided in the description below, but I'll cover them in more detail when we know more. For now, though, I'm very excited to see the addition of new unique buildings that reflect the time period. And that's everything for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the mild history lesson alongside a brief overview of what we'll be getting in just a few weeks' time. It's sort of funny making what is essentially a lore video about human history. As always, though, thank you very much for watching, and make sure to subscribe for more Total War content. Till next time. Cheers.